Take a walk on the wild side, shall we? Why did you call it the wild side, Spike? There, there seems to be an idea here that it might be dangerous down here, or it might be, uh, yeah. Mainstream society is a little bit of a, uh, intimidated by it or, or afraid of it. I'm, and yeah, so I said it in jest because uh, it's not the wild side at all. It's just a, it's a neighborhood of people that uh, are going experiencing a lot of pain and, and dealing with a lot of trauma. And what kind they, of pain do people typically go through? Well, it, 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 high poverty area. There's 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 all kinds of tra uh, people. People survive all kinds of trauma from early childhood abuse to 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 you know relationship pain to you know just yeah just. People have gone through a lot down here. Do you think addiction is a disease and is an illness? Definitely. You know, what mm. starts out as an original choice to use substances to self-medicate from the pain turns into a lifetime of suffering. And, and I became dependent on using um, heroin and fentanyl because reality was, was painful. Opioids like heroin and fentanyl belong to the same pharmaceutical family as morphine. And like morphine, they were intended for pain relief. Everyone in this self-medicating community has a backstory, and pain, both physical and mental, is all around. Is this person OK? Well, we'll, we'll check right now. I'm sure they're probably breathing, but hey, how are you? I'm fine. Cool. Uh, we're, we're filming the wall, but uh, we, won't, we won't, OK? Yeah. Cool. Sorry to inter sorry to sorry to come into your space, ma'am. I, I had an ugly childhood, and so I I, I dabbled. Um, yeah, I, I was running away from things from an awful lot of pain when I was a kid, and I I, I used narcotics. Uh, I cleaned up in 1997. I cleaned up to raise my child. I was a, his mother killed her, killed herself, and I raised my I was a single dad. I raised my child my son, and and because uh, I I owed him a life, and and. I have an amazing son. He uh, he turned out exceptionally well. I did it. I'm really proud of the job that I did. Uh, and then I had an accident, and it kind of brought me back. Uh, I got hit from behind on my bike. I broke my legs, my pelvis, my hip, my ribs, ripped my rotator cuff, crushed both hands, broke my back in four places, my skull in four places, my face, my nose, my teeth, with a shearing brain hemorrhage. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a good day in my world. If I'd have met you down here 10 years ago, what would the difference have been? No. Oh, yeah, you would, you'd have probably, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have met me. <laughs> if you would have met me, I'd be apologizing right now. So, uh, completely different What person. would you be apologizing for? Oh, uh, probably for something that I'd done to you or, or taken from you. Or, but yeah, I'd inject drugs 30 to 40 times a day. I mean, so, wow. yeah, I mean, just uh, the shell of the, you know, a person that was just... How much was that costing? Oh, probably a good uh, 600 bucks a day. Fentanyl is now sweeping through North America at a horrifying rate. Since it hit the streets, drug overdose has become the leading cause of death for those under 50. You can't find anyone in these alleyways who hasn't lost a loved one. It's scary how commonplace it's become. Have you lost any friends, Michelle? Through, yeah. through this fentanyl shit? Oh my that? god, my brother, I love my brother. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, me too. How did your brother die, Michelle? In fentanyl, yeah. So sorry. <sighs> That's the fentanyl Even truck there. No, I'm <laughs> Perhaps fentanyl's cruelest trick is the Stockholm Syndrome it pushes to its victims. The more it devastates this little community, the more people seek solace in its arms. But here in the hardest hit neighborhood, the very people in the midst of its grip are the ones leading the fight back. Right now we're gonna to go to the Washington Needle Depot. It's peer led and we hand out uh, harm reduction supplies for the community. Peer led means that the people that, the staff that work there uh, use drugs themselves and are part of that community. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's really important that people from the community are the ones leading it. Hey guys. Hello. Hi cameras. <laughs> <laughs> so double hey. shift, no one showed up for this afternoon, so we're going to go hit up the East End. Perfect. 
And we'll, yeah, we got uh, one OD this afternoon, one this morning. Oh, uh, man. 55 needles found and some nar two Narcan kids giving up. So. That's your first day. Yeah, first day. So not bad. That's amazing. All right. Thank you we'll so much. It. We'll hit it hard. You're welcome. Well Take done. Care, See ya. And it was this guy's first day? Yes. And he saved an overdose already? <laughs> yeah. Is that pretty common? Would you have an overdose every day like that? Well, I mean, we, it depends on where the routes are. But downtown Eastside, it's pretty common. Inside this building, clean injecting equipment is handed to locals through a hole in the wall. The idea is to stop the spread of blood-borne viruses like hepatitis and HIV. It's open 24 hours a day and hands out a million syringes a year. So, Corey, how many needles would you give out in a normal shift? Oh, wow. Um, I've gone through, one of these boxes have 500 um, rigs in it, and one day I went through four boxes of rigs. In one shift. Rigs. Yeah, that was a busy day. Why is it so important that people around here can get access to those clean needles? Well, they'll, they'll, use, they'll use whatever they need to use. They'll use a dirty rig that they find. They'll, that's how people get hep C and, and AIDS, right? They'll share rigs. They will use toilet water, puddle water, um, whenever they need to, to use to get water, right? And I guess that water's going straight into their bloodstream, and that does not sound great. Well, you can you imagine the diseases in these alleys where people urinate and feces, and, you know, this is known as piss alley. <laughs> it smells like piss, right? From the back of the building, the staff run a mobile response unit working in shifts to reverse street overdoses. So for my shift, I have my vest on. I have a 8.8 Narcan ready to go. I have my bike, my helmet, and I always have extra Narcan on me. So in case I come across multiple overdoses, I'll put that right here right now. Workers like Jen patrol these alleyways, administering life-saving medical interventions. Their secret weapon is naloxone, the fentanyl antidote, commonly known by its brand name, Narcan. Fentanyl is an opiate, and what it does is it shuts down your respiratory system. So pretend that like this, this here, this is fentanyl coming in your system, right? So when you shoot someone up with Narcan, it's like a wall goes up, and so the fentanyl hits the wall, it can't keep on going. The more Narcan you put into the system, the bigger that wall gets. So what you're saying is, is it's actually quite easy to reverse an overdose? Yes, it is. So then, if it's that easy to reverse an overdose, why do we have so many people dying of overdose? Because people are using by themselves. People are really ashamed about their drug use. You're labeled as a criminal or a junkie or a crackhead. So they use by themselves in, in dark places, you know, like where people can't see or can't find them until it's too late. If you find someone overdosing, how long have you got? You got three minutes. And that depends. I mean, usually it starts off that their lips are blue, and then you, you, know, you, you only got so much time to react. If you find them that their face is purple, it means you're staying on death's door. And if you find their face is black, you have like a slim chance of bringing them back. So when you do find someone that's OD'd and you're able to turn that around to save their life, how does that feel? Extremely stressful and traumatic. <laughs> um, you know, you remind yourself this is why you do this job. So for myself, personally, in the last two years, I respond to 31 drug overdoses. One Friday, we had 103 overdoses. And then a week later, we had 12 people die in the city of Vancouver. One day. And one day. Corey, how does it feel to work in a place like this where you're saving lives every day? Um, sure you can. Um, it means it means a lot. Um, because I lost uh, my son's father, the love of my life, to a heroin overdose. I like it. It feels good to uh, save a life instead of be just part of the problem, right? So it's kind of being part of the solution. You know, when it comes to addiction, don't be surprised, right? It's a monster. And um, you don't know, they, people don't even know who they are anymore. How's it affected you personally? Oh, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> it's affected me tremendously, right? Changed your life.
What do you do? I can get a tube and four pieces of tin foil, please. Yes, of course. Okay. There's one in the point here. The city of Vancouver has invested millions trying to combat the crisis. And while health responses like this have made some inroads, fentanyl has at times been an impossible challenge for lawmakers. It has become so bad that average life expectancy is officially reducing and a public health emergency has been declared. It's caused a deep mistrust from those in the community here towards those in power. Try to keep the, ca the camera on this side of the street, not too much on that side. And, okay. and then and tell someone he tells us to fuck off, we'll walk up. <laughs> British Columbia has four times the landmass of the UK, and yet 7% of all its 911 calls came from these two blocks. There's another one over there, Spike. There's the three police cars up there. They are horrendous. They, you know, if people are out here, they're at the lowest they can possibly be, and the police want to fucking grind them a little further into the ground. Like, does it make sense? Not to me. If I'm bleeding to death, I don't want their help. You'd rather just bleed out. I don't want their help. They're not my friends. And, and you know what? I'm sure I've played a part in every single interaction. I, I'm not, yeah, I have a colorful vocabulary, and I'm. I've been known to have a bit of an attitude. However, they're professionals, right? I'm not a professional. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a professional, they are. There's always cops somewhere. There's three cars right there. And to be totally honest, I think a lot of it is just like PR to show that they're out there, you know? Because they, they don't give a shit about us. The cops are literally watching them shoot up, and they do not arrest them. They've got a bunch of drugs on them. They do not, because they want to contain it, it yeah. and keep it away from the city, keep it away from, from where people are spending money. And if the cops had rolled up when you were selling me that fentanyl, do you think they'd have arrested us? No, they tell you to fuck off. They grab me, put me against the wall, search me, take my shit, and tell me to fuck off. They say, go explain that to your boss. In spite of the ill feeling towards them, the police say their approach is based on pragmatism. And it's certainly true that there's open public drug use in full view of them. You guys live on the streets out here? Yeah, yeah. we've been in downtown east side for over a year. Is that hard sleeping rough out when it gets to winter here? It's, uh, last night was last very, night was very, cold. very rough. Yeah, no, we got, there was rain and uh, the blankets were wet. We had to move. Um, our, we uh, had weird. Uh, we had weird people like watching us, and and we just watching had, you. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was weird people like that came up and just like were standing at the end of a like the foot of like our bed, and he was just staring at us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of creepy. It is creepy. It is. It's very creepy. <laughs> this stuff happens here every single day. Yo, we rapping iceberg cold world iceberg more fire yo. <laughs> I love it, bro. Yo, you gotta just get check this rapper out. Iceberg Cold World, free, free BDs for you for life. Yo, we in the background, we love it. Yo, we, yo, free BDs. We got, we got, I don't know what that means. <laughs> How did you guys meet? We met at the library. <laughs> and he. Uh, I ran after her. He chased me. <laughs> yeah. Why did you run after her? Love at first sight. <laughs> Yeah, we were we were we were we were in we were in the library and we were catching eyes. <laughs> and then I laughed and then and then she laughed and I saw her walking down the street. And he ran. I said I cannot let her leave. <laughs> so I ran after her. And I freaked and I freaked <laughs> he her. Up and he's like, "Hey." <laughs> I'm like, "Whoa." <laughs> but you have to admit though, 5 minutes later we were making out right yeah. right around the corner. Right so, there? <laughs> no, no, no. And that's, no, not, oh. no, not here. We, 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 were, we, were, we, did, we did make out like five yeah. minutes later. Yeah. <laughs> is this person OK over here? Well, no, this, this is This, is, this the, is normal. This is, this is. This is totally normal. It's what we call, it's what we call the, the nod. Uh, the nod. Or, or the, uh, the Hastings shuffle. We, we've been there. We, we've, we've, we've smoked heroin. I overdosed. Like and summer. I had I had somebody narc on me twice, okay? Saved your life. Yeah. I almost died. His lips were blue. My lips were blue. I was dead. Just, you 
you shouldn't do it anyway. Stop doing drugs altogether. That's why liquor and weed is all The person who that, gave it to us said it was heroin, and it yeah. wasn't. What do you think it was? Fentanyl. It was definitely. We didn't even have that much. No. We used to like a dragon. Yeah. Like we were smoking. And I, and I, I was done. A dragon, as in one, you just, just a, inhaled one. Smoking once. it off of a foil. Smoking like, it off of a foil. We each did like one, like, hoot, basically. Yeah. And, and, I, uh, and I basically almost died. From one we, inhalation. One. Yeah. I was freaked out because they said, like, he was ODing. What would you have done if I died? That would have crushed me. I don't even want to think about it. How does it make you feel looking back on that day, Stephen, thinking you nearly did? I'll never do it again. Never again. Homelessness in Vancouver is at its highest since records began. And as hardship rises, so does addiction. Across the water on a disused construction site, 300 homeless people are forming a temporary community. The conditions here are brutal but they feel they have nowhere else to go. People are very vulnerable out here. Families with jobs and kids cannot find housing. They're sleeping in tents. It's a total human rights violation is what it is. You know, I've seen refugee camps in other countries. This is exactly what it looks like. We are Canadian refugees. This is a Canadian refugee camp. Mind if we have a look at your tent and see where you're staying? Okay, it's way down here. <laughs> this is my tent. <laughs> I'm embarrassed because it's usually cleaner than this. <laughs> this is my buddy. And here, this is Bruce. <laughs> He's been with me uh, since, since I've been here. <laughs> Yeah, and they got eagle feathers up there. They're saving me, keeping me safe. Yeah, like I said, it's a bit of a mess here, but I golf, so. Oh, you play golf. <laughs> I'm not any Tiger Woods or anything. Okay. But. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Oh, four! <laughs> I think it went in my tent. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it smashed the side of your tent. <laughs> oh, well, that's all good. I got grandchildren. I haven't seen them for a while. So I have toys out here just to remind me of them, my grandsons, and... Um, and you've actually got Narcan here all around the flower pots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got them hanging all over, right? Because mm -hmm. it happens all the time. It's, it's an epidemic. Uh, naloxone... Um, that's the uh, overdose kit. I've had to Narcan somebody 10 times. And one was a husband and wife, actually. We're taking care of her, and he started overdosing, and they were laying kind of head to head, and it, it, they were reaching for each other as they were overdosing, like they knew. For many here, drugs are the only source of comfort. Overdoses are a regular occurrence. But from the roadside at the perimeter of the camp, a small group of activists are helping to reduce the death toll. In here, we have most of our supplies. So we've got our generator, chairs, a table. Um, we've got Narcan. Um, we've got information pamphlets. We've got bottled water that we like to hand out to people. Yeah. Everything you need to keep people alive today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
In a few hours, campers will come to this pop-up tent to smoke and inject drugs, including fentanyl, under the watchful eyes of the volunteers, safe in the knowledge that if they do OD, someone will intervene. That one's, this yeah, corner's broken, I think. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> you know, technical difficulties sometimes. Rather than giving clean equipment for users to take away, the volunteers here invite them into the tent to use their drugs under supervision. But what is the legal status of the tent? It's illegal. Uh, when the police do come by, and they might come by today, we kind of just remind them we're in the midst of an overdose crisis. It's been declared a health emergency by the province of BC, and, uh, you know, we're not here with the intention of breaking the law, right? We're here with the intention of you know, providing people with a safe, supervised space to use drugs and uh, respond to overdoses should they happen. It's an odd situation. Although fentanyl is illegal and the tent is unsanctioned, the medical supplies are directly provided by the health department. In times of crisis, sometimes laws become secondary. In the case of overdose, if fentanyl is the assassin, many believe societal attitudes to the homeless are a key accomplice. Isolation is a big problem. Shame and stigma drive many battling addiction to use alone. There's a lot of hate. You know, people think about junkies, thieves, crackheads. Um, sure, there's that, a lot of thieving and stuff going on, but there's real people here, you know. We get people driving by, throwing bricks, throwing bottles. Mm -hmm. Very hurtful. A lot of people take it to heart. I try not to, but... Mm -hmm. Still do, you know, it does hurt, for sure. I worked many, many years. I pay my way and um, I collect bottles every day. I average 10 to $15 a day. If you make $15 today, let's say, how would you spend it? Uh, 10 of it would probably go to drugs. Fentanyl? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sad, but true. Yeah. And why do you do it? What does fentanyl feel like when you take it? Just a big hug. <laughs> it's, yeah, just a warm place and nothing can hurt you. Homelessness and addiction has caused real damage here. But community life is vibrant and humanity abundant. And in an area of so much intoxication, a sobering thought emerges. How many of these people would not be here if it weren't for naloxone? <laughs> <laughs>